So tell me if this is normal. I was raised in New York, and so that's not normal. But have you ever had somebody get in your face and let you have it? And I'm just curious. Has that only happened in New York? No, there's a few of you. Just, okay, just a handful. You ever get somebody just irate with you, and they're like, they're so close, they're actually spitting on you, letting you have it, letting you how, know how much you have let them down and how furious they are with you. Now, if you haven't experienced that live, the next best thing is online. Anybody ever been trolled? Anybody attacked online for something you posted? Just a, You guys haven't lived yet. Come on. If you're really out there, boy, people will let you have it. So imagine how uncomfortable that made you, how, how self-conscious that made you. And think about this, because Moses, Moses is going to get that plus. He's going to get, he's going to get review bombed on steroids. He's going to, people are going to let him have it. So what's going on is hundreds of people are in person going to let Moses know how frustrated and angry they are. And it's going to be so bad that Moses is later going to say, hey, I, I was fearful for my life. I thought they were going to kill me. I thought they were going to stone me. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Exodus chapter 17, and we're talking about how God wants us to live with him now that we've been set free. Because that's what the story of Exodus is about. It's about people being redeemed, being set free to live with him on their way to the promised land, which is heaven. And in the wilderness is all of these stories about how do we live with him now that we've been set free. And this is a powerful story about testing God. So we're in Exodus 17, verse 1. So the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from one place to place as the Lord commanded, and they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So it's been over a month. They've been moving their way through the desert. They've, they've struggled with food, but God took care of that. He gave them manna. But they've been now trudging for days, and they find their way to a place they call Rephidim. And that actually means pillows. It means cushions. It was finally a place to rest because God moved them and moved them hard and fast and brought them a great distance. And finally... The two million of them could kick back, take a break, because the pillar of cloud by day and that pillar of fire by night finally came to a rest and said, okay, we're all getting a break. So they're there in this desert at Rephidim, and they're right by Horeb. You ever heard of Horeb? Horeb is another name for Sinai, Mount Sinai, Horeb. It actually means brilliant or bright heat. So imagine that section of desert, how hot it was, that they named it bright heat. And so they're there, and two million of them, and there's no water. Have you ever been in the desert? Have you ever been hiked through the desert? You realize how important water is in the desert? Experts say you might be able to go three days without water. In the desert, it is even shorter than that because the heat just dries you out and you need this constant supply of water. And so two million people in the middle of this bright heat desert and there's no water. And so the people start to freak out. So verse two, so they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. They said, hey, it's your responsibility. Give us water to drink. And Moses is like, hold it. Why do you quarrel with me? Where, where do you think I've got water for two million people? You think I'm hiding it in my pockets? Do you, you, you think I can just pull it out of my ear? What, what, what do you think this is? Uh, this is? This is not me. I'm not the one who's taking care of you. I'm not the one who's even responsible for you in that way. That's God. So why do you quarrel? Why do you get upset? And why are you spitting in my face so hot and heated? Back up. All right, that's kind of what Moses is saying. But notice what he says next. He says, why do you put the Lord to the test? And that's a key to this passage. Why do you put the Lord to the test? We're going to have to talk about that. Verse 3. But the people were thirsty for, for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Now, if we can just take a moment to put ourselves in their sandals. Think about what it was like 
no water, you're in this intense heat, you're finally not moving and you're just, you're just kind of kicking there and you're just relaxing, but, but there's nothing to drink. And so you're focused on this and you're thinking about your kids. And, and the mama bear and the papa bear comes out because there's nothing we're more protected of than our kids. And we love our kids and our kids are not gonna survive as long as we're gonna survive without water. They need some water. And so I understand them getting frustrated because they want their kids to thrive, but also their livestock. They're saying, hey, this is our livelihood. This is our future. Everything's going to die out here, and all we're going to have is this valley of dry bones. It's going to be bad. This whole incident, believe it or not, is famous. In fact, the Bible's going to talk about this one, one incident over and over and over again because there's lessons in it that God wants us to get. And so before we dive into this word testing, notice what God said in Psalm 95, what he says to you and I and what he says to all of his people. He says this, he says, do not. So God is like saying right up front, hey, what? <laughs> regardless about everything else, make sure you don't do this. And remember, this is about living with God. He said, this is not the way to live with me. Do not harden your hearts. God doesn't want us to have hard hearts. And we'll get a better picture of what that means as we go down this, this road. But he says, do not harden your hearts as they did at Meribah. Well, where's Meribah? Meribah's the name of the place they're in right now because they're gonna, it, it's going to be named it because of them. Meribah means quarrel. This is where the fight broke out and where Moses thought he was going to lose his life. And so it gets named after their critical, just heated kind of thing going on. So do not harden your heart as they did at Meribah, at quarreling. And as you did that day at Massa, it's all the same place. It just got three different names. Rephidim for pillows, Meribah for quarreling, and then now Massa means testing. Because it's the place they tested God. And he's saying, whatever you do, in this life with me, as you do your journey with me, and this is God speaking, make sure you don't harden your heart as they did. Don't be like them. Don't do that. Whatever you do, where your ancestors tested me, they tried me. See how he says it over and over again? Though they had seen what I did. So what is this testing thing? What, what is it and why is it so wrong? God says, hey, that's a hard heart that tests. And, and you don't want that kind of heart. Well, what is a heart to test? What is it? So think about it this way, because this is, this is a totally different culture than you and I have ever experienced. They have literally hundreds of gods. That's hard for us to imagine. There are more gods than are our flavors at Baskin Robbins. There are more gods than you've seen at the largest Chinese buffet as far as dishes are concerned. Right? There, there are hundreds of gods in every culture. Like Egypt had 80 major gods. Those are the major gods. And then there were lesser gods. There were hundreds of them to pick and choose from. And if you go to Canaan and you explore the gods of Canaan, they literally had hundreds of gods as well. And the Philistines had hundreds of gods. There were hundreds and thousands of gods to choose from. And so if you're living in that culture, how do you ever choose? Which is the right God for you? Because you get to choose. And, and it's like this, this smorgasbord of smorgasbords. And it's like, okay, which God is going to do me right? Which God is going to be best for me? And you approached it entirely in this, what's in it for me? What do I get? And so what they would do is they would be drawn to a God. They would hear about a God, maybe a relative or grandma would say, hey, this is the God for you. And you would hit this trial. You would hit this hardship, this crisis or whatever. And you would be like, okay, I need help. And so grandma said I should look to this God or my buddy says it's this God. So I'm going to pray to this God and I'm going to bring him an offering and I'm going to hope they're going to come through for me. I'm going to test them to see if they're real, to see if they will meet my needs. And if they come through, great. I'm going to let you be my God. That's the idea. But if they fail, you lose me, and I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. Because you failed. You, didn't, you did not meet my needs. 
So this whole idea of testing has this idea of control. That I am in the driver's seat. And I get to choose. And, and, and you are my God. Meaning you got to work for me. And you, it's kind of like a, bent, a vending machine. It's, it's so mercenary. It's so commercial. It's, it's like, and I'm shopping for the God. And I'm going to keep looking for a God till one does what I want them to do. And then when I find out, okay, they're my God. And then even after that, they better come through again. Because I can leave them if they, if they fail me the next time. So it's all about control. And God says, hey, whatever you do, do not harden your hearts as they did at Meribah and they did at Massa where they tested me. So that hard heart, this is what happens because it happened to me Monday. I caught myself in it. It's interesting how God does these things just in time for a sermon. Monday, I found myself angry with God. I was, I was frustrated. And it took me a while to tease it apart to understand what was going on inside. You ever have these, like, what's, why am I so angry? And basically what it came down to is God didn't do what I wanted him to do. Anybody ever been in that boat? God did not do what I wanted to do. And I was angry. And I was frustrated. Because the vending machine God did not, boom, this is what you wanted. So I'm just living, I'm living that morning and I'm just, wow, I'm angry with God. That's a hard heart. That's a hard heart. And everything just kind of shut down in me. And I had to <laughs> examine my heart. The Bible says, Proverbs, hey, watch your heart. Watch over your heart. Guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. Everything flows from that. And so if I, it was ruining my day. But it was because I was being a spoiled, petulant, entitled little baby boy who didn't get his way. That's that idea of testing. And there's a huge difference between going through life where I'm in the driver's seat and I'm on the throne of my life and expecting God to do things for me the way I want them to. And the other way is the way of faith and surrender that gives the throne to God. And I humbly submit to what he wants for my life. It's a totally different attitude. And God's saying, as you do life with me, as you go down the road, as you do this wilderness thing on your way to heaven, don't live the attitude of the tester. Live the attitude of the truster, in a sense. So, so this is what happened to Jesus. Remember Jesus? He's, he's, he's uh, fasting for 40 days. He goes into the wilderness just before his ministry starts and the devil comes to and tempts him. This is actually one of the, the great temptations of Christ. Notice, it's, it's in Matthew chapter 4. He says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. So this is Jerusalem. He's at the temple and Satan able to transport Jesus to the peak, the pinnacle of the temple. And this is what he says to him. He says, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. Just jump. Throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So he's saying, hey, this is a shortcut. I'm going to give it to you right now. All you have to do is from way up high here is to jump. Because the Bible promises that if you jump, God will rescue you in midair. The angels will come and lift you up. And the temple's a really public place. Everybody's there in the temple courtyards. And they will see it. And they will see you get rescued by the angels. And then they will know. They will know that you are the Messiah. You are the promised one. And it's like a shortcut to being accepted. A shortcut to fame. It's basically, don't do this God's way. Do this your way. You seize control. You take the driver's seat. You do it. You basically, you're going to manipulate God into doing what you want. And so, what does Jesus say? Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your Lord, the Lord your God, to the test. Don't do it. It's a whole different lifestyle. So this is all about faith. 
This comes down to what real faith looks like versus this false faith. Because there's a lot of people with this false faith, and there's a lot of people that, that, that pursue the things of God for a while until they get frustrated, until, until God doesn't give them what they want, and they take their ball and they go home. Because they don't truly have real faith. They have this, what can you do for me? And what have you done for me lately? And if I don't like what you've done, I'm out of here. Versus faith is way more humble and way more submissive. And it's about lordship. Think about faith. I call faith the currency of heaven. I call it the currency of heaven because it's what God looks for. And it's what God honors. It's what saves us, is it not? Doesn't faith save you? When, when we're lost <laughs> in our sins, we need somebody to rescue us. And we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. As James puts it, we all stumble in many ways. And so we need somebody to come to our rescue, and that is Jesus. And so we believe in him. We put our faith and trust in him. We say, you are now Savior and what? And Lord. And he means Lord. He is Savior and Lord. And then after that, it's not just one event of faith. We then live by faith. We now have to make every decision based in trust and faith. So think about it. We're supposed to rely in his character. We're supposed to know he loves us, he cares for us, and he will be there for us. For instance, he has good plans for me, and I know his plans are good. And I can rely on his plans. I don't have to be suspicious of them. I don't need to be fearful of them. God will take care of me. That's faith. That's trust. And God wants us to live out of faith every moment of every day and every decision. Romans puts it this way. Everything that does not come from faith is actually a sin. Anything that doesn't roll out of trust, anything that doesn't roll out of, man, God, I know you've got me, and I know you'll be there for me, and I know you have good plans for me. Anything beyond that, he says, that's sin. So this is big. This is the currency of heaven. This is what God responds to. God will not respond to controlling. He will not respond to manipulation, but he does respond to faith. And there's a huge difference. So, I told you this story is all over scripture. Here's another place. So Psalm 95 was one. Here's now Psalm 81. Here's what God says that happened there. He said, I tested you at the waters of Meribah. But hold it. I thought they were testing you, God. Well, both was happening. How was God testing the people at Meribah? He was testing them with the water test. He was, he was basically leaving them without water to see how they would respond. Why? to see if they would respond in faith or not. Would they trust him? Now, did God not know how they would respond? God tests us all the time. Does God not know what's in us? No, he knows. The testing's really not for him. He already knows what's in our heart. He knows what we're going to do. He's all-knowing. So testing is not for his benefit. It's for our benefit. It's to reveal areas of a heart that still need work, that still has problems. And so Monday for me was a test for God to show me, Mike, you still got work to do. And God is saying, hey, at the waters of Meribah, I was actually testing you. Because your faith is important to me. I want you to operate out of faith. Peter puts it this way. He says, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. That happens in life. But what we know as Christians, as believers, and, and our relationship with God is God is now watching over our lives. And he is only letting certain things into our life now. And if they come into our life, it's because he's allowed them to be there, because he's sovereign, he's in control. And if he's allowed them to come in, the suffering, the trials, the crises, it's for a purpose. Notice what he says. These have come. You see it? These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, 
which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. What is Peter saying? He's saying God so loves you, he allows trials in your life. And they're to test you. They come intentionally. These have come so that they might prove the genuineness of your faith. That you've got the real article that will give glory to God when he comes back. So God at Meribah is taking these two million people that he's been with and has been taking care of all of this time. And he's saying, okay, will you now trust me? Will you now trust me? And they didn't. Now think about what they've been through with God. He's sent a redeemer. Remember they were in bondage in Egypt. But God's right there and he escalates the situation through 10 plagues. And he basically brings Egypt to its knees and humbles Pharaoh and ruins. That absolutely destroys the economy of Egypt. And systematically brings them to the point where they say, okay, get out of here. 10 plagues. And when they finally say, get out of here, Egypt gives them this incredible wealth. They go out with gold and treasures. God did that. So Moses, plagues, treasure, and then he's a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of, of uh, a fire by night, and he leads them out into the desert, right into the Red Sea. <laughs> and Pharaoh changes his mind, and he comes with his army, and what does God do? He intervenes and parts the Red Sea so they can walk through on dry ground. And when Pharaoh follows and his people now are safe on the other side, God crashes the wall of those waters back down on Pharaoh and wipes out those troops and Pharaoh. And the people are free on the other side. And it doesn't end there. He's done all this for them. And then there, they don't have any food, right? We saw that last week. No food. So what does God do? He sends quail that one night. He sends quail, millions of quail, and they feast on meat. And then after that, the following morning, they have manna in the morning where he gives them bread to eat. And what's so crazy about this story is this. They had just picked up manna that morning. Doesn't it come every morning? Well, ex except for the Sabbath. Manna came every morning. They had just picked up their daily supply of bread and they're testing God. What has he done for me lately? God, you better do this or I'm taking my ball and going home. I'm picking another God. You, you, better, you better show up. We need some water. That's the idea here. We're in control. We're manipulating you. You better, and God doesn't respond that way. He's not going to respond that way. He doesn't work that way. And a lot of you have discovered that. You've prayed, you've begged, you've tried to manipulate God, and he's not manipulated. He just will not be. But Moses is different. Notice how he responds, verse 4. So then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? That's a good question. What am I to do with these people? And this is where he tells us that he feared for his life. They are almost ready to stone me. What does faith look like? Verses this testing, what does trusting versus testing look like? Faith looks like this. Faith says, you are Lord, and I trust you. So I'm not calling the shots. I'm not in control. You are. What do you want me to do? You're in the navigator's seat. You get to dictate God, and I'm the servant, and I just do what you tell me to do. So notice, what am I to do with these people? What do you want me to do? What's your plan? What's, what's your solution here? That, believe it or not, is an incredible faith-based response. God, what do you want me to do with my day? Versus, this is my agenda, God. Bless it. This is faith, God. You're in charge. What do you want me to do? What's your plan? Because they're about ready to kill me. It'd be nice if you put it in place. So I don't die today. That's the idea here. The other attitude is pride, this arrogance. I'm in control. God, you do what I want you to do. Versus God, tell your servant what you want me to do. Totally different things. 
And so God responds to faith. He responds to Moses. He didn't respond to the people, but he responds to Moses' faith. Verse 5, so the Lord answered Moses. He said, go, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. The simple plan. Go out in front of the people, lead them, get some elders around you, make sure you have the big staff with you that you had in Egypt, and go out into the desert. Verse 6, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. So this is the location, obviously, people knew the rock at Horeb. So they went to this rock at Horeb, and he says, strike the rock with the staff, obviously, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So go out there, lead them all out to this place, strike the rock, and water will gush out of it. And it says, so Moses did this in the sight of the elders in Israel. So just to let you know what actually happens, remember the stories everywhere because it's such a huge, pivotal story in Israel. Psalm 78 says this, he split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. So imagine this, you're out in the, the most incredibly dry desert you've ever been in in your life. <laughs> and you are parched and dried to the bone and, and your mouth is dry and you're desperate for a drink of water. And he leads you out into this craggy, rocky area and suddenly, after he hits this rock, it just gushes like a fountain. And it's not just a little bit of water. It gushes like, it says, like seas, as abundant as the seas. And it flows down like rivers. And suddenly, there's this, this growing lake in the middle of Horeb, right there at the rock. So this is the rock of Horeb. So you can go out there today. So this is, this is in Saudi Arabia. You can go out to the rock of Horeb. And if you go there, you'll see this has been flooded with water. This has been inundated with water. The, the rocks are not jagged and, and pointy like they are all, all over the place in the desert. Here they've been worn down like they've been underwater. And water has rushed over them and kind of eaten away at them. You know the smoothness of river rock. So Moses goes up to this rock. It's whole. He hits it with his staff and it splits. It's cleaved and all of a sudden, out of that rock, God miraculously sends this living water. What's, what's living water? Living water is just flowing water. It's how they would call it. It's running water. And it would just gush out like a fountain, like rivers. And it flooded this whole area and created a lake. Because how do you supply water for two million people? There's got to be serious amounts of water. And God just gushes out this water and takes care of the needs of his people. And God comes through again. It's incredible. It's a powerful picture of how God wants us to go through life. Trusting versus testing. This is how the story ends, verse 7. And he called the place Massa, which is testing, and Meribah, which is quarreling, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? How dare they ask that question? But have you ever been there? God saved you. He's been in your life in powerful ways. And then you'll just have that day and you wonder, has God left me? Has God abandoned me? What, what's going on? Have you ever had bad days, crises hit where, where maybe there's, there's tension in your marriage or there's problem with the kids or that thing at work or that, that thing in your family, some family drama or financial stuff or <laughs> mechanical stuff, something breaking down. And you're just like, God, why have you abandoned me? Where, what have you done for me lately? And what do we do in those moments? Because there's part of us that are tempted in those moments to say, I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. Because you've forgotten about me. And I'm mad. You didn't do what I wanted, and I'm going home. And as a pastor, I've had conversations with way too many people where it's just this bitterness. I prayed that you would save Grandma. When she was dying, she had cancer, and God didn't, God didn't act. He didn't do. He didn't, he didn't heal her. I, I prayed that Mom and Dad's marriage would be whole, that he would bring them back together, that they wouldn't get a divorce. And God didn't do what I asked him to do. 
I prayed that I would get a certain job or get into a certain college, and God didn't do what I asked him to do. And there's just this hurt because they tried to control God. And God says, you will never control me. I'm sovereign. I'm the Lord. You are not the Lord. And you adopt my plans. I don't adopt your plans. I'm on the throne. You are not. And so what happens is people chase after God for a little bit, thinking that God's their meal ticket. He's going to be their vending machine or Santa Claus or whatever he's going to be. And they, they try to control him and manipulate him. And he says, sorry. Do not test the Lord your God. And in frustration and anger and bitterness, they turn and walk away. Don't test God. Trust God. There's a huge difference in attitude and lifestyle. Don't be the one that's controlling, doubting. Be the one that's humble, humble and trusting, faithful. What does the Bible say about what God responds to? Well, for instance, the Bible says God exalts the humble, gives grace to the humble. If somebody's demanding of God, basically saying, do what I want, are they being humble? And then God responds to faith. It will be done to you according to your faith. So faith and humility is what God's looking for in this life. Not arrogance and pride and control massively different things don't test god trust god and so paul puts it this way in corinthians paul's going to sum up this whole story he says this he says they were all baptized into moses in the cloud and in the sea so even the parting of the red sea as symbolism for baptism do you see that they were they were they were baptized into a whole new way of life it was their entrance to this new life with God outside of Egypt, away from their sin, in a sense, away from their oppression and slavery, and they were set free to live with him in a whole new life. They were baptized into this new life. And they all ate the same spiritual food. What is he talking about? He's talking about the quail and the manna that God provided for them in the wilderness. And they drank the same spiritual drink. What's that? That's the water, water from the rock. For they drank from the spiritual rock. And what is this spiritual rock? that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. That, that rock, that rock of Horeb, was a, a picture and metaphor for Jesus. And notice it was hit. It was hit with a staff. It was struck, and it cracked. But out of it, living water flowed. This grace of God flowed from Christ to us, into our lives, this living water. But notice this last line. This is the part I want you to see. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. You see that? God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And what I'm saying is this. There's a lot of people that start out with God, thinking God's going to be the answer for whatever problem they have. That, that, that God's going to give them that job, give give them that spouse, give them that way of life. And they're looking at God as this meal ticket. What can he do for me? And they try, they test God. And so they enter into this existence. But for the life of them, they can't live by faith. And so they can't stay with God. And they can't go to the promised land. Because they really never had faith. They never really trusted that he's Savior and Lord. Their attitude was, I'm Lord and you're my genie. Do what I want you to do or I'm going home. And so they didn't make it to the land. They're totally different attitudes. Don't test, trust. Don't test, trust. Which is about humility and faith rather than control and doubt. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you this morning that you do love us. 
and that your character is not in question. Lord, you love us more than we could ever imagine. You love us with this everlasting love, this deep, unquenchable, unending love. And Lord, you have good plans for us. <laughs> you have plans to give us life and a future. Lord, help us then to be more and more people of faith, more and more people of trust. Help us to be a people that, that submit and honor you, that let you be on the throne of our lives and be Lord. Help us to be the kind of people that face crises. And even if you don't do what we want you to do, it's okay because you are Lord. Help us, Lord, today, right now, to give up control, to give up the throne, give up calling the shots. That's not our place. Help us to pry our fingers off the steering wheel and get out of the seat and give it to you. Jesus, take the wheel. Help us to move from ourselves to you. Help us to make that transition of faith, of trust. And let us give up this testing, this means of control and this constant doubting. And help us to find peace instead and surrender. Help us to live as you've called us to live, as your people. And help us to serve you. And Lord, for the people in the room that just don't know you yet, as they do their journey and as they search for you, help them to realize that Jesus is the answer. That he's the rock in the middle of the desert that can give them water, that will fill and satisfy and give them life. And help them to do the incredible thing of finally letting go and trusting and asking you into their life, not just, not just as a savior, but as Lord. And set them free. And help them find that's where the life is. <laughs> that is where the joy is. That is where the peace is. That is... That is where the power is. That is, that is where purpose and meaning is. And that is where we live. Help them to come and discover the greatness of God. Bless them in that way. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.